Stranded planes, bombed out buildings and unrecoverable debts, all brought about by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, could end up costing investors billions of dollars. Right now, there are around $10 billion worth of Western-owned airplanes trapped in Russia. The owners are required to get them back by Monday morning, and Russia is making plans to nationalize them. Russian aviation is one of the key targets of the sanctions imposed by the EU. The sanctions prohibit the sale, transfer, supply or export of aircraft or any aircraft components. Leased aircraft are included in these sanctions. As such, existing lease contracts with Russian carriers have to be terminated within 30 days of the sanctions being imposed. And that means that all existing contracts must be terminated by the 28th of March, which is next Monday. As soon as the sanctions were announced, airline leasing companies rushed to get their airplanes that were leased to Russian airlines back, impounding 78 of them at airports around the world over the last few weeks. The Kremlin moved quickly to block aircraft repossessions by passing a law allowing foreign airplanes to be registered in Russia, effectively nationalizing them. Russian airline companies lease a lot of planes. Aeroflot, Russia's national airline, has leased about half of its fleet by value from non-Russian lessors. The Financial Times estimates that right now, more than 450 commercial aircraft owned by Western companies are stranded in Russia, with a combined estimated value of over $10 billion. The airline industry reacted quickly to the announced sanctions. The sanctions on the provision of spare parts had an instant impact with the Dutch carrier KLM asking two flights that were on their way to Russia at the time of the announcement to turn around mid-air. The legal mechanism for the repossession of leased aircraft is known as the Cape Town Convention, an international agreement that Russia signed which allows secured lenders such as aircraft lessors to repossess the planes. The way such a repossession usually works is that the owner of the airplane files in a local court to enforce the contract and once that's done, they can send a pilot to fly the plane back to be serviced and released to a new company. Under the EU sanctions, the leasing companies have until March 28th, so next Monday, to cancel contracts, and then they have to find a way to collect the planes from Russia. The new Russian law gets in the way of this, as it effectively means that Moscow can confiscate these airplanes but of course, this law would only apply in Russia, so the planes could never leave the country afterwards. Tony Ryan, the co-founder of Ryanair, effectively invented the aircraft leasing industry when he founded Guinness Peet Aviation in the 1970s. And this heritage, combined with attractive tax rates in Ireland, means that the airline leasing industry is dominated by Irish companies, where 14 of the world's top 15 lessors are domiciled. For this reason, most of the planes leased by Russian airlines are Irish owned. Although this new law has been passed in Russia, so far the planes don't yet appear to have been formally nationalized. But this of course could be done at a moment's notice. Authorities in Moscow are possibly using the existence of this new law as leverage and it appears that instead of enforcing it right away, they're trying to negotiate their way around the sanctions. The Russian transport minister put forth earlier this week that alternative options include continued lease payments or an outright purchase of the jets. The owners have been unwilling to negotiate on this front for the fairly obvious reason that any financial agreement would be a clear breach of the sanctions on Russia. The Russian transport minister told the press, we're not losing hope, but we're not giving them back because that would mean to leave oneself without aviation. Bermuda and Ireland, where many of the planes are registered, have suspended the airworthiness certificates of the planes trapped in Russia. Once again, this only means so much, as if they don't ever leave Russian airspace, they only have to comply with local Russian law. International flights, both in and out of Russia, have mostly stopped due to the widespread airspace closures. 
but the few flights that have been happening are being operated by Russian-owned aircraft. Russia seizing these planes would mean that these planes would likely never fly internationally again, but the nationalization would give Russia the domestic fleet it needs to keep operating internal flights, and quite a few spare planes that could be cannibalized for parts to overcome the OEM parts ban. Russia is quite a large country and there would be plenty of use for these planes within Russian airspace or between Russia and countries like China and India who are not sanctioning Russia. Credit Insights, an independent credit research firm, argues that Russia could use the impounded aircraft for what they call Russia Pariah Airlines. And the Russian transport minister has said that Russian authorities are examining how Iran managed to maintain flights under many years of similar restrictions. Iran has managed to get by for years with an aging fleet of Western aircraft, and apparently they can buy counterfeit parts for, for these planes in China or manufacture them internally in Iran. Reliability does become a big issue over time, though. Additionally, Iran's aircraft, being older, are significantly less software intensive than the recently made planes uh, that are being used in Russia, so homemade parts might not necessarily work on all of the newer models. Aeroflot has most of their technical maintenance done in Germany, and without access to skilled technicians and spare parts, these planes may not be able to fly safely for very long at all. The airline leasing business has not been an easy one over the last few years. They've had to be quite flexible with their customers due to the pandemic. The reduced demand, particularly for wide-body aircraft, encouraged lessors to work with troubled airlines rather than taking their aircraft back over the period. The airline industry has long been a tough sector to invest in. Warren Buffett famously wrote that if a far-sighted capitalist had been present at Kitty Hawk, he would have done his successors a huge favor by shooting Orville down, referring to how much money had been lost in the industry over the years. Buffett famously sold his airline stocks near the low when the pandemic struck in 2020. A friend mentioned to me that an investor could do much better by investing in airline component manufacturers rather than airline companies. And I was able to quickly backtest that idea using today's video sponsor, Composer. Here are the results displayed as a chart. Composer is a great website that allows investors who are not necessarily able to write computer code to backtest and analyze the trading strategies they come up with. You use a no-code visual editor to create and modify different strategies. Let's say you want to see what Warren Buffett's returns would have looked like without airline stocks, or what Kathy Wood's returns without Tesla look like. You can quickly analyze this in Composer. They have a bunch of pre-designed investment strategies that they call symphonies on the site, which you can use as is, or you can easily modify them to meet your needs. It's a really useful tool, especially for people who don't code, but I would recommend when trying it out to keep in mind that the results don't include transaction costs or take taxes into account. So if you find a strategy that seems to work well for you, you'll need to consider these factors before investing. Before Composer, if you wanted to create a rules-based investing strategy, you'd need to be a skilled Python coder, an Excel wizard, and pay hundreds if not thousands of dollars for expensive trading software. But with Composer, you can seamlessly drag and drop, edit and swap investing blocks for free. Subscribers to my channel can sign up for free today by using my link in the description below. Anyhow, back to our main content. Airline leasing companies buy around 60% of new passenger jets and lease them out to airline companies around the world. They can do this as they have access to cheaper financing than most airlines, and they can send airplanes to the parts of the world where there's the most demand. This means that they're less exposed to off-seasons than a lot of airlines who mostly serve a particular geographic region. 
While this situation may be a significant financial hit to the leasing company's balance sheets, it shouldn't be an existential threat. While they will book losses on the lost revenues, as well as possibly the value of the aircraft, it doesn't appear that the situation will lead to bankruptcies. Aircap, the world's biggest lessor, has around 150 planes leased to Russian customers, with an estimated value of $2.2 billion. This is 5% of the value of their global fleet. SMBC Aviation Capital is the next in line with planes valued at around $1.3 billion leased to Russian customers. Avalon has planes with an estimated value of $266 million leased, which is a bit over 1.5% of the value of their fleet. Initially, most of these companies will have some protection due to the security deposits that they take, which are typically three months worth of lease rentals. After that, they'll fall back on insurance companies, and apparently discussions with insurance companies have already begun, with some lessors reviewing whether their aircraft hull insurance coverage will help them recover prospective losses. Russian airlines typically would buy primary insurance from Russian insurance companies, which in turn might reinsure with Western companies or syndicates in London or Bermuda. This situation could potentially cost insurers billions of dollars in claims. The fact that Russia passed this new law allowing foreign airplanes to be re-registered in Russia might help airline leasing companies as it demonstrates Russia's intent to confiscate the planes, which is often a critical aspect of war risk insurance. Of course, different companies will have different insurance policies. The global market for specialist insurance with Lloyds of London at its center is already pricing in a hit. Shares at Lloyds underwriters such as Lancashire and Beasley, specialists in exposed areas such as war and political risk, have fallen sharply in recent weeks. Lloyds, which took a net blow from COVID-related claims of more than $4 billion in 2020, have not made any announcements about their overall exposure, but said that Russia and Ukraine account for less than 1% of their premiums. It's estimated that a worst-case scenario where planes could not be recovered would leave the global insurance market with a loss of over $5 billion. A loss like this far outstrips the returns available from writing this type of insurance, and some underwriters might decide to exit the sector entirely. Insurance premiums would be expected to rise in the future as the risk of the sector is reassessed. Aircraft leasing companies have reported that some insurers were progressively cancelling certain elements of affected insurance policies. If this is happening, the dispute will likely come down to the timing of the cancellation notice. Did they come after sanctions were imposed but before the planes were expropriated? Experts in the space are arguing that if insurance losses mount, we'd likely see a situation where the insurance companies look to governments to take some of the hit, given that the losses will have been brought about by government action. As you can imagine, this whole situation will be good for lawyers. Aircraft leasing companies usually either own their airplanes outright or finance them by selling asset-backed securities, meaning that they sell bonds that are backed using the planes as collateral. As the airlines repay their lease, the money flows through to pay interest and principal on the bonds, with higher rated tranches of debt being paid first. One asset-backed security from Carlyle Group's aircraft leasing business, issued in 2019, includes five planes leased to Russian and Ukrainian airlines. These leases make up more than 30% of the collateral backing the bonds. They have another trust with 24% of value with those exposures. Ukraine still does have a fully functional banking system and is making debt repayments. Another deal from 2017 includes seven leases to Russian airlines, and this makes up more than 20% of that portfolio. The ratings agencies, who were always quick to close the barn door after the horse has bolted, have placed many tranches of these deals under review. 
The lease terminations and repossession of the planes under such a challenging environment may further stress revenue collections for affected securitized transactions, which are still on a slow path to recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, noted S&P analysts. There are many ways this situation could work itself out, but in the medium term, it's likely that we will see companies that operate internationally take political risk a lot more seriously. Over the last 30 or more years, we've seen Western companies trying to open up new markets all around the world to expand their businesses. When we look at the supply chain disruptions that came as a result of the COVID pandemic and this situation in Russia, we might see companies looking to do more business close to home where these risk factors may be more manageable an acceleration of the trend towards onshoring and nearshoring. Don't forget to check out today's video sponsor, Composer, using my link in the description below, as well as their disclosure. If you enjoyed this video, you should watch this one next. Have a great day and talk to you again soon. Bye.